Ask the average person to find the country of Ukraine on a map, and they probably would have difficulty. Because it seems so far away from so many people, it's hard to fathom the implications of a conflict in Ukraine and its effects on our daily lives. Make no mistake though, a more significant conflict in Ukraine will have a dramatic impact on you no matter how far away from the country you may be. Ukraine has struggled to find a path between competing interests. On one side are Europe and the United States. On the other side is Ukraine's long-standing ties to Russia and the East. It's a flashpoint of a renewed geopolitical rivalry. This video will summarize the conflict and the motivations behind the future conflict as simply as possible. War has many faces beyond the now old trench and mustard gas warfare of World War I or even the bombing campaigns of World War II or the napalm of Vietnam. War is very different now, and we're very likely to see conflict shortly between Russia and Ukraine. Hopefully, this video will inform you why you should be preparing for the potential war to come. Download the Start Preparing Survival Guide to help you prepare for any disaster. I'll post a link in the description and comments section below, or visit cityprepping.com forward slash get started for a free guide to help you get started on your journey of preparedness. Recent History Crimea A former Soviet Republic, Russia would love nothing more than to regain control of Ukraine. In 2014, they tried to do just that. On the 23rd of February of that year, Russia secretly sponsored pro-Russia demonstrations in the Crimea city of Sevastopol. Crimea was a peninsula of Ukraine along the northern coast of the Black Sea in Eastern Europe with a population of 2.4 million. Four days after the pro-Russian demonstrations, mass Russian troops bearing no insignia entirely denied by the Russian government seized the parliament of Crimea and captured strategic sites across the region. The pro-Russian Sergei Aksonov, a puppet leader whose strings were tightly tethered to Moscow, was installed literally, at gunpoint. After sealing the doors and confiscating all mobile phones, the members of parliament who Aksnanov had invited to enter the building passed a motion in the presence of the gunmen, armed with Kalashnikov assault rifles and rocket launchers. Sources have alleged that Aksnanov served in the mid-1990s as a lieutenant in the criminal underworld and was nicknamed Goblin. Though he maintains that a cession of Crimea to Russia isn't necessarily because the two countries work independently and together, Crimea is viewed as now being directly controlled by Putin. What is Russia planning? Any action in geopolitical conflict distills down to two main motives, gain and offense. Offense, as in one country, is offended by another country's actions, people, posture, or threat, either real or imaginary, or gain where one country values the resources and land of the other country. One is typically in response to the other. A country lays claim to the land of the other, and that country fights to retain it and seeks the help of other nations. Germany expanded beyond its borders and laid claims to other lands, and other countries responded. Iraq invaded Kuwait, and other countries sent them packing back to their own country. China aims to acquire Taiwan, and other countries are threatening to respond. These are examples of ill-gotten gain that resulted in more significant geopolitical conflicts and outright wars. History is littered with these events. One country's gain is deemed ill-gotten, against some global code of ethics, and the offenses taken, resulting in retaliation. In the most destructive response, people are killed, both civilian and military. In the least obvious ways, a cold war, sabotage, disinformation campaigns, propaganda, cyber attacks, espionage, and a host of other covert operations are implemented to destabilize and attack the enemy. The face of war is much different than Vietnam, World War I or II. Russia demonstrated this when Putin sent in elite fighting forces with no insignia. Troops were already in the country, sort of sleeper cells, just awaiting activation. There wasn't a big spectacle of border crossings, as much as people suddenly awoke to a controlling force that may or may not have been their own. Many in the country and most worldwide knew Putin was behind it. Still, it created enough confusion as to who was whom. Ukraine forces, rebels, pro-Russian Ukraine separatists, Russians or others. The confusion provided enough time to delay any meaningful response and institute a government that answered to Moscow. It was a small war that created its fog and built upon the soaked ideas of the pro-Russian demonstrations just days before. So what is Russia's motivation here? Gain or offense? Given the relations between Russia and Ukraine in the past and the restoration of control over a former Soviet bloc country, it's a little of both of them. Regaining control of the former Soviet country would be a show of strength for Putin, a point of national pride. He views Ukraine as historical Russia. Putin doesn't want Russia's southern neighbor to join NATO or the EU. That would represent a turn so westward that Russia views this as a threat to its security, 
and it would be. In a draft proposal that Russia sent to Western negotiators, they demanded a ban on NATO deploying either weapons or forces in Albania, Bulgaria, Estonia, Croatia, Czech Republic, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Slovakia, Romania, Slovenia, Montenegro, and Northern Macedonia. Russia views NATO adding these former communist countries to its cadre as a violation of the United States promise that came after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the withdrawal of Russian forces. Finally, and becoming of less importance with the advancement of hypersonic missiles, Russia has never wanted the missile strike capability of Western forces so close to its borders. This goes back to the 1960s when the United States was threatening USSR by putting missiles in Turkey. It's a complex problem, and I have to oversimplify it here to get as much of it in as possible. However, if you distill Putin's motivations down to one thing, it's national pride. Restoring Moscow's control over former communist countries demonstrates his power, stretches Russian influence and interests, and reduces further opposition. Control over Ukraine directly or through a puppet government that answers to Moscow is a gain that corrects a perceived offense in their eyes. It's a restoration of the Cold War era in Russia's former greatness. Will Russia attack? Observers can only guess at the hypotheticals and possibilities, just as we have to guess at the chess game Putin is playing. Given his previous record and style, the answer is yes. Remember, Putin is the one who allegedly ordered the poisoning of Viktor Yushchenko, the third president of Ukraine after failed previous assassination attempts. Russia will make overt and covert moves to gain control of Ukraine. Like a chess game, the moving and maneuvering of 120,000 troops along the Ukrainian border, with the threat to double that number in mere days, is partially moving the pieces in place to provide more opportunities later and part of a distraction. In chess, this is similar to what is called a deflection. It's a chess tactic that forces an opposing piece to leave the square, rank, or file it occupies, thus exposing the king or a valuable piece. It's a forced distraction while Moscow is probably moving covert pieces into key positions and locations around Ukraine to attack and destabilize from within. Having the Russian troops there provides extended game options should the other pieces fall into their attack. The troop buildup on the border is part of a show of force, part to have them ready when needed and mainly as a distraction. After all, members of the US-led military alliance, NATO, border the Black Sea, including Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey. The USS Mount Whitney is in the Black Sea right now, along with other vessels of the United States Sixth Fleet. The USS Mount Whitney is a flagship and command ship of the United States Sixth Fleet. USS Mount Whitney also serves as the afloat command platform of naval striking and support forces NATO. Putin is well aware that providing a large target to such a formidable force would be a grave error. The Ukrainian invasion may not take the form of missiles and tanks rolling into Kiev. Assassinations and kidnappings of people and grabs of strategic locations will occur when the go sign is given. Destabilization efforts, cyber attacks, attacks on infrastructure will likely occur simultaneously. Forces won't be as apparent as troops lined up on borders or huddled in cities. Putin also is not interested in a world war. He proved he could win without a global military response when he annexed Crimea in 2014. International wars are bad for business, and Russia depends on its ability to sell oil and natural gas to Europe, Asia, and other countries. The value of Russian exports of crude oil mounted to nearly 73.4 billion US dollars in 2020. Russia exports $25.3 billion worth of natural gas. That $100 billion realized in 2020 was actually down, probably due to European and other Western nations still being angry about the annexation of Crimea and meddling in the sovereignty of Ukraine. Europe has a complicated addiction to Gazprom liquefied natural gas, and it's a cold winter. American LNG liquefied natural gas is plentiful, but an ocean away and has a thirsty population of its own, reeling with inflation and wrestling with high prices. As I have covered in other videos, LNG is also used to make fertilizer. Fertilizer plants separate hydrogen from natural gas and combine it with nitrogen taken from the air to make ammonia, which farmers use on the soil to maximize crop growth. This impacts agricultural operations around the world, decreases yields, drives up prices, and creates turmoil and destabilization in countries around the world. Knowing this, when Russia does move on Ukraine, it will probably be accompanied by cutting off natural gas exports for would-be opposition in Europe and elsewhere. This week, Russian state energy giant Gazprom said that it had not booked any capacity to pump gas to Europe through the Yamal pipeline next year, underscoring a sharp drop-off in Russian exports to the region so far this year. So, this move may have already begun. 
The U.S. really would like to see the European nations and allies move away from their addiction to Russian gas, especially since Moscow wields the addiction like a chess piece. Still, U.S. production, price, and logistics make it so much harder to get resources to those thirsty nations that need them. If oil and LNG are part of the overall plan, Putin will assuredly make his other moves while Europe is in its cold winter. That will be right now through mid-February. Beyond energy, nations that would be logically opposed to Russia controlling Ukraine will be attacked through cyber attacks. These will be simultaneous to other actions and solely intended to destabilize countries and encourage internal conflicts. JSB and the Colonial Pipeline were just scouts for far more significant possible attacks. As I have covered in other videos on this channel, an attack on our railway systems, navigation systems, power and water systems, even navigational systems in the internet will grind everything to a halt. Could it be that the timing, at least in the United States, will correspond to the 5G rollout pushed back by the network providers due to airline pressure? What better way to hide your clandestine cyber attacks than by creating the illusion that 5G ultra wideband is to blame? Who will retaliate? The United States has, with the likely assistance of NATO countries, shipped military material to Ukraine. It has threatened the supply even more if necessary. Covert operations have assuredly provided small arms and other guerrilla warfare type armaments to would-be future resistance pockets in Ukraine. There are approximately 200 US troops in Ukraine to train and mentor the Ukrainian forces. There are probably at least that many covert operators in the country. The problem with deploying US, NATO, or any other Western troops in the region is twofold. First, it represents a counter buildup and will surely result in an escalation of conflict. Second, it plays into the Russia propaganda machine that a Western invasion is a Western expansion and imperialism, that Ukraine is too weak to stand on its own, and that pro-Russian policies are the only way to maintain strength. The most immediate retaliation to any Russian attack on Ukraine, if it could be proven to be tied back to Russia, if it rose to that test on the world stage, would be heavy sanctions. Even without world approval of the sanctions, the U.S. still retains enough influence to force sanctions. Those sanctions are both comprehensive and selective, blocking assets and restricting trade to accomplish foreign policy and national security goals. Comprehensive sanctions, also called an embargo, generally prohibit all trade with a specific country or region. Russia would be unable to sell its oil and liquefied natural gas, and the U.S. would encourage this by slashing its prices on exports and bolstering contracts to European nations. The cost of oil and LNG will go up. Putin will encourage this price increase, making enforcing the embargoes more difficult. So, was he a cyber attack on the Colonial Pipeline by Russian state-sponsored ransomware hackers a trial run for a more extensive planned disruption to break up a possible future embargo? How this will impact you. While we won't likely see ourselves in a prolonged ground war in the Ukraine involving UN or US forces, we will still feel the effects no matter where we live. The supply chain is still trying to correct itself. Economies are still struggling to recover. The available resources right now may be in abundance, but they are sparsely distributed. Even the perception of a larger conflict in Ukraine is driving up prices. Actual world engagement, sanctions, embargoes, a nuclear threat, and the continued insecurity and instability will skyrocket oil and LNG prices. They could easily double overnight. This will impact agriculture, resulting in lower yields. That's a threat to your food supply in all facets of your life. It will impact manufacturing and shipping, driving up prices and forcing some operations to close altogether. That's a threat to any product you need and puts normal, everyday life on back order. Imagine going to the grocery store, but there's little food because manufacturers and processors are producing less. Farmers and ranchers have lower yields. Even packaging is in short supply. The global economy and the global supply chain are intricately woven together. In any conflict, what we're about to see in Ukraine can pull it apart. If you're globally dependent on the economies and supply chains working correctly, the Ukraine conflict should worry you as superpowers face off on a battlefield that is already torn apart. You may think you're not dependent on a functioning global network, but if you've shopped at a grocery store instead of a local farm, you are. If you ordered a part or a product for anything or to fix anything, you are dependent upon a functioning global network. Any Ukrainian conflict that is large enough will likely result in cyber attacks against Russian adversaries. This creates domestic conflicts while also keeping the flow of dark money to Russia in the form of ransoms to compensate for direct sales impeded by embargoes. There is a mountain of evidence that Russia runs active disinformation and mischievous division campaigns in many Western countries. This long game is working too. 
America and many of its would-be allies are reeling with instability resulting from a deeply divided population stoked by Russian disinformation campaigns. Russia is analogous to that bully that punches you every time the teacher isn't looking. Putin will try to get away with as much as he can in Russia's best interests while always denying and not being seen delivering the punch. And there's always a little doubt whether it's really him behind the aggression, even when it's really obvious. And that's Vladimir's Putin gambit in a geopolitical chessboard. Now, as far as across that board you may be, far from the Ukraine and the kings on that board, you are tied into the game's results. In the long term, this could revitalize a Cold War. And in the short term, it is another factor in the destabilization of a global system we're all dependent upon functioning correctly. Now, while I don't think the world has a stomach for a drawn out ground war nor a nuclear war, though these are still possibilities, I do believe that we're looking at a cyber, covert, and economic warfare. And this will impact you and your country no matter how far you are away from Ukraine. Now, hopefully this summary has provided you with enough information, albeit simplified, to really recognize this threat and understand how it will play out in your life, even thousands of miles away from the epicenter of the conflict. What do you think? Are you taking measures to ensure your food, your water, and energy independence are all set up to really counter these global complications that are about to play out? Let us know in the comments below. And look at some of my other content on bugging out so you know what to take with you if you have to. I try to read many of the comments and respond to them when I can, and that's typically within the first hour of releasing a video. Now, I'd also ask you to please consider subscribing to the channel if you'd like to be notified when I release a video. Please consider giving this video a thumbs up to help the channel grow. As always, stay safe out there.